Uh, let's talk about politics. <laughs> let's talk about politics. Now, as soon as I say the word politics, I feel the tension in the room begin to well up. I watch some of your heads and some of your heads are like nodding like, all right, it's about time we talk about this politic thing here in church. And then there's a couple of you that are back there sitting your, your arms crossed and you're like, oh boy, what did I get myself into today? If this is your first time at Grace Point, welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, man, it's, uh, politics are an interesting thing, right? Uh, because no matter what you think about it, we, we, all, we all bring our own, uh, our own perspectives. We all bring our own experiencings, uh, experiences. We bring our own biases into conversations like this one about politics, but I want to do today is I want to get us to a place of, of common ground. So whether you're passionate about politics or you're completely burnt out, overwhelmed, and exhausted by politics, you need to understand that politics is something that is part of life. It's part of the, the world that we live in. And so today through the series, I want to find some common ground for us. I want to find common ground that will help us as we navigate the complex relationship between politics and faith. And so I want to talk to you for the next little bit about this idea of navigating politics. Navigating politics. Because, you see, the word politics, uh, it comes from the Greek word politica. And it simply means this. It means the affairs of the cities. And it's simply, it's how the societies, how they organize themselves. But let's be real. Sometimes politics feels a little bit more like this definition. Poly, meaning many, and ticks, blood-sucking creatures. <laughs> the truth of it is, though, the truth of it is that we can't avoid politics in our daily lives. We can't avoid politics in our daily lives, whether it's because of the election cycles, it's because of the policies that affect the families that we have, or the debates that take on about moral issues or ethical things. Politics, they're everywhere. Politics are all over the place. And as much as we try to, much as you might want to avoid politics and political discussions. We have to talk about how our faith intersects with politics because we live in a world where those two things are inseparable, politics and faith. But here's the thing. It's not just out there where politics take place in the world. It's part of our faith journey. It's part of our faith journey. See, Jesus, he wasn't just apolitical. Jesus lived in a time where the Romans uh, they conquered and had rule over Israel. And so Jesus was understanding of this. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which yes, we often in the church context talk about them from the religious side of things, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they weren't just religious figures. They were also political leaders in the world that Jesus lived in. And so Jesus, he has a lot to say politically and how we do life, a lot to say about power about justice and how to treat people. But here's the catch. This series that we're starting today, Kingdom Values in a Political World, it's not about telling you how to vote. I'm not going to be here and I'm not going to teach you and, and preach to you about any political party. Instead, my goal is to help you align the, your political engagement with kingdom values. My job and my goal is to help you think through politics in a Jesus-honoring way that are full of the values that Jesus himself lived out. And so we're asking this question, how do we engage in politics while glorifying Christ? How do we engage in politics while glorifying Christ? And so as we dive into this, you need to understand and three things that you need to keep in mind is I'm not going to tell you how to vote. I just want to set the stage right now. I'm not going to tell you how to vote. My goal isn't to endorse a candidate. It's not to endorse a, a political party. What I want to do is I want to equip you with God's wisdom on how to engage politically. You as an American citizen have a right and a duty to vote. But I believe that it's aligning your vote with God's kingdom values. That's what it's about. And so I'm not going to tell you how to vote. The other thing that you need to know is that 
you might not hear what you want to hear. You might not hear what you want to hear. So whether you're on the left or on the right or somewhere in between or on the top or on the bottom, your political side is not going to be validated. I'm not going to validate the other side and challenge the other side. Everybody, because God's word, it doesn't perfectly align with any earthly political system. So we're all going to be challenged no matter where you line up on the political spectrum. And then the third thing you need to know as we enter into this series is this series is for everyone. No matter where you're at, left, right, like I said, top, center, down, bottom, I don't care, outside, inside, I don't care which political party affiliation you do or don't have, God's kingdom will challenge your political views. God's kingdom will challenge your political views. And this series, it's about reminding us of that. It's about reminding us of that. It's reminding us that your faith should shape your politics and not the other way around. Your faith should shape, should influence your politics and not the other way around. So let's look at Jesus, the perfect example. Let's look at how Jesus approached the tensions, the political tensions in the day that he lived in. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 16. If you got a Bible, you can make your way there. Uh, if not, it'll be on the screen for you. Don't worry. But before we jump into Matthew chapter 16, I got to kind of set the stage for you a little bit. What's transpired into the verses we're going to be looking at today is Jesus has just got done feeding the 4,000. Now, there are two miracles. Many of us are accustomed and aware of the feeding of the 5,000. But this one, Jesus feeds 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a few fish, which, by the way, is a miracle, all right, just so you're aware. I've never fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. I can barely feed my kids with seven loaves of bread, all right? So it was a miracle that takes place where Jesus feeds these 4,000 people. He gets in the boat with his disciples. They cross the lake, uh, um, they, the lake, the lake, excuse me, they cross the Sea of Galilee, which is a giant lake, but they cross the Sea of Galilee, and as they get across to the other side, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they find Jesus, and they come and they ask him this question. They're trying to figure out if Jesus can, can give them a sign from heaven that proves he is who he says he is. And so Jesus, he tells the Pharisees and the Sadducees this story, and they don't like this story. He tells this parable with the deeper meaning, and they don't like the story. And then Jesus and his disciples, they get in a boat, and they cross back across the other side of the lake. And so this is what's all transpired. They fed 4,000 people. They had this altercation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the religious and political leaders of the day. And then they cross back across the Sea of Galilee. And as they're crossing back over the Sea of Galilee, Jesus, he gives his disciples a warning. In verse 6, Jesus says to them, be careful. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Pause. Yeast is an interesting thing to be warned about, isn't it? I mean, this, this is really scary. This is incredibly scary. I mean, it says that it's alive and it's active. Like this, this breeds fear into me. No? Not, not you? The yeast, it doesn't breed fear into you? Look at this, this little package of yeast. It doesn't look like a whole lot, does it? I mean, it's just an itty-bitty, tiny little package with some grains, kind of sand-type grains that, that you put into a, a batch of dough. But what happens? Well, it doesn't look like much, doesn't seem like much. Guess what? It's not something that would scare you. I mean, if I pulled this out and said, oh, none of you are going to jump. And be like, oh, I got to run because he's scaring me. Now, if I walked at you with scissors and went, oh, you'd run. But with a package of yeast, you're like, you're a crazy person. Like you, would la like you just did. You laughed at me when I said, ah. Like that's what you would do to me. And, and so this package, it doesn't seem like much. This little itty bitty bit of yeast doesn't seem like a whole yeah, a lot. It doesn't seem like it's doing anything powerful. It's just yeast. But if you mix it into the dough, it transforms everything, right? You take this little package of yeast and it transforms everything everything. It's a very small ingredient that makes a big impact. The yeast, it's what makes the dough rise. It's what gives the dough, it changes the texture, it changes the flavor, it, it gives it this incredible appearance. A little bit of yeast, it can change everything. That's the thing about yeast, is you don't see it working. You don't see it working, 
but it changes the entire substance that it's mixed into. So when Jesus tells his disciples, beware of the yeast of the Sadducees and Pharisees, like, what? The, the Pharisees, they were these they were these small town conservative kind of people. They were the small town conservative group. These were the individuals, the Pharisees. These were the ones who were devoted to, to God, to, to scripture. But if you read the gospels, if you read any of the, the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life through the four gospels, you know that the Pharisees, while they knew the scripture and claimed to have this love about God, they had lost the heart of what God cares about. They had lost the things that, that God valued on a deep le level when it comes to things like compassion, when it comes to things like, like justice or, or loving those who are in the margins. Now, the Sadducees, they were a different group. The Sadducees, they were more like the progressives of that time. Uh, not completely, that's not a word-for-word word kind of fit, but they were kind of on that spectrum, if you will. The, the Sadducees, they were the urban, the upper class, they were the more educated, the more sophisticated. But the thing about the, the, the Sadducees is the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the full Bible. In fact, the Sadducees, they only believed in what's called the Torah. It's the first five books of Scripture. They only believed in the Torah, which means that because they only believed in the Torah, they missed out on believing in things like the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They missed out on things like life after death, things like angels and demons, because they only believed in the Torah. The Sadducees, though, they were in the minority. They were in the minority there, but they were the ones that had real power in Jerusalem, down in, in there. They were the ones who controlled the temple. They held the influence over the cultural things, uh, the cultural institutions of Israel. Because what happens is, is the Sadducees, they got their power, they got their wealth by compromising with Rome. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were like the Democrats and the Republicans of America. Both they were part of the same nation, and yet they had vastly different views on how to live and how to govern. And yet, despite their differences, despite all of that, they had one thing in common. They rejected Jesus. They were so consumed with their own beliefs, their own political views, that they missed the Messiah who was standing right in front of them. And so immediately after this interaction takes place, Jesus and his disciples, they get back on the boat across the lake. And Matthew, he mentions something that is interesting. He mentions that the disciples forgot to bring bread. Remember, they just fed 4,000 people with seven loaves of bread. They forget to bring bread back on their journey across the lake after this altercation with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And Jesus, he makes his statement about being on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so the disciples are like a little bit confused because they probably, my assumption is they thought Jesus was talking about their failure to bring bread. And I think it frustrated Jesus a little because look at his response in Matthew 16, verse 8. He says, aware of their discussion about who forgot to bring the bread, Jesus asks, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus isn't talking about actual bread. I hope you understand that. It's an analogy. But it takes the disciples a couple minutes because, hey, they're just average Joes, sometimes a little bit knucklehead-like. And they finally figured out, though, that Jesus wasn't actually talking about a physical loaf of bread. He was using it as an analogy. And so for clarity's sake, Matthew, he wants to clear everything up. And he says in verse 12, then... They understood that he wasn't telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Jesus is saying that the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these, these religious leaders, these individuals with, with great political uh, influence, they can slowly infiltrate, they can slowly change the whole heart of a person, and they can change the whole heart of a community. And Jesus is warning against that. 
Think of the Pharisees and the Sadducees like modern-day political parties, right? Different beliefs, different goals, but often driven by the same underlying desire to not give up control. Both groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, missed the heart of Jesus' message because they were so focused on protecting their power, they were so focused on defending their version of the truth instead of following God's truth. It's important for us to understand some of this historical context of this text. In Jesus' time, religion and politics, they weren't separate. They were, they were together. They were bound together. The Pharisees, and the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, yes, they were religious leaders, but they were also political powers. They influenced the very aspects, every aspect of culture, the, the social part of culture, the spiritual part. They, inf they infected and, and a few infused so much of culture. These groups, they acted kind of like the gatekeepers of, of who to allow in and, and who to keep out. They had the authority to interpret the law, interpret scripture. And despite their theological difference that they had, they united around one thing, rejecting Jesus. Why? Why would they unite around this rejection of Jesus? Because Jesus didn't fit into their political or religious mold. Jesus challenged their political structures, their expectations, their power structures, their ideologies of what the Messiah should be. These weren't just any leaders. Understand this. These guys, they were experts of the law. They were experts in the scriptures. And not only that, they had created uh, hundreds of additional rules and stipulations based off of their own interpretations of scripture. Uh, and people, they, they followed them religiously. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they actually gave enormous influence over how people lived, how they believed. See, back in this time, questioning an authority, it would have been completely unthinkable for most people. Most would have never thought to question the authority of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And yet, that's exactly what Jesus did. That's exactly what Jesus did. He wasn't warning the disciples about the Pharisees and the Sadducees because they, those individuals were inherently bad people. The issue was that they were so rigid to their commitment to their teachings, it had blinded them. Their worldview had become so important that it actually kept them from seeing Jesus. Instead of their devotion to Scripture leading them toward Jesus, their devotion to Scripture had actually led them away from him. And today, we face a similar challenge. We face a similar challenge today. We're constantly inundated with political ideologies, political opinions, political viewpoints. And many of these are deeply important to us because they matter. These things matter. But the problem arises when we let these things define us and influence every other aspect of our lives. Just like in Jesus' day, you and I, we have Pharisees and Sadducees in our own lives whether it's in politics, social movements, or even our own personal beliefs. And if we're not careful, their yeast, it, it can start to, to influence our hearts in ways that will subtly lead us away from Jesus. Jesus, the warning that he gives to the disciples is just as relevant today as it was nearly 2,000 years ago. Because just like the yeast changes the dough, political ideologies, they can subtly shape our worldview. And before we know it, we're more focused on winning debates than loving our neighbors. And what happens is we start identifying ourselves as conservative Christians or liberal Christians. And the reality of it is they don't exist. We are Christians, period. We are Christians, period. 
not liberal Christians, not conservative Christians. We are Christians. And as Pastor Tony Evans puts it, puts it he says, Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. He didn't come to choose Democrat, Republican, Independent, Libertarian, Green Party. He came to take over. Our, our political identity should be in Christ. We can't allow our politics to define who we are as followers of Jesus. Our faith should influence our politics and not the other way around. But what happens when we forget where our true identity comes from? What happens when we forget where our true identity come fr comes from? Tim Keller, he talks about how our identity, it used to be rooted in things like God and family and community and, and you knew back, back in the days that, that, that you knew it was expected. You would get feedback from those who were in your community and you would begin to adjust your life based on that. But now things are different. We live in a different world today. Our world, it's shifted in a big way. We live in a culture that's all about individualism. It's all about me. It's all about what I want. It's about what, what, what I feel, how I feel. Because we've become so mobile, those face-to-face -face communities that, that many of us knew from long ago, we've distanced ourselves from that. And what happens is we're finding our identity not in, in Christ and in the community we're surrounding ourselves with, but we're finding our identity in other things. The faith that used to shape our foundation in who we are in many cases, it's not there anymore. It's not there. And Keller's point is this. And it's so relevant today. He says that people are attaching their identities to all sorts of things. They're attaching their identities to, to political positions, to views on, on social issues like masks or vaccines or even climate change. He says it's like we've substituted our faith. It's like we've substituted our, our faith in, in who we are, our, our faith identity for something else. And so what he says is so now on when, when someone disagrees with your stance, with what you believe and, and your, your viewpoint. He says it's not just about a difference of opinion. He says it feels like it's a personal attack. Why? Because people's identities are tied to their positions. People's identities, who we are, is tied to our positions. And so that's why conflict, it feels so personal in the generation that we're currently living is because our, our identity is tied to our political or other uh, position. And when someone's anchored into a position on a certain issue, when an attack comes, that's why it's personal. Because it is. Your identity comes from your position. That's why it's personal. The real question here is, who are you becoming? Who are you becoming? Are you becoming more like Jesus? And who he asks us to, to live like? And maybe you're like, well, but wait, we're Christians. Isn't our identity in Christ? Yeah, theologically that's true. But culture is shaping our faith so much differently who are you becoming? Are you becoming like Jesus? Or are you becoming more like your political party? The yeast that you allow into your life, it begins to determine what you become. Are you letting the teachings of Jesus guide you? Or are you letting your political positions dictate your values? As Christians, if you claim to follow Jesus, you claim to be a follower of Jesus, understand that your loyalty is to God's kingdom first. Your loyalty is to God's kingdom first. We're called to bring kingdom values. Values like love, justice, mercy, humility into the political environment, into political engagements. If we lose sight of that, that we're supposed to bring kingdom into those things, we risk becoming like the Pharisees, the Sadducees, so consumed with our earthly politics that we miss what God is doing. Jesus, he doesn't want you to fall into the same trap that so many other people have fallen into, which is a life that's controlled, a life that's, that's dictated. 
not by our faith in Jesus, but dictated by our political opinions. And so Jesus, he uses this yeast analogy for the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And Paul, he tells us why as he speaks to the church in Galatia on false teachers. He says in verse 7 of Galatians 5, you were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following this truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. This false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. If you've ever made bread before, you know how powerful yeast is. Right? It doesn't look like much to begin with. It doesn't look like it's going to completely transform and change that little pile of dough that you've got there. But the yeast, it changes everything. The yeast, it's what makes the dough rise. It gives the bread its flavor. It gives it that incredible, amazing smell. Can we just take a moment and pause? Smelling fresh bread? I don't know about you, but I'm a carb person and some fresh bread. Woo. Oh my goodness gracious. Thank you, yeast. Whoever invented yeast, God, for bringing yeast into the world so we can smell fresh bread. But that little bit of yeast, that little bit of yeast, it completely transforms. It completely changes transforms what the bread becomes. Now think about what Jesus said. Think about what Jesus says. Maybe the teachings of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, maybe, maybe their teachings didn't seem that harmful. But Jesus knew that the wrong yeast was filling them. And maybe, maybe that wrong yeast is filling your life as well. Because if that yeast began to fill your life, it would change you into something that Jesus never intended for you. Jesus didn't want his followers to be shaped by the teachings, those teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, because he wants you to become more like him, not more like a political ideology. We're called to be like Jesus. First John chapter 2 says this, those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. As followers of Jesus, we can't claim to be in him while letting our lives be shaped by some other ideology, some other belief system. We're not called to be molded into the wrong influences. Instead, we're chasing after holiness. We're pursuing the image of Jesus. And that won't happen if the wrong yeast, the yeast of our modern ideologies, is the main factor in shaping who you are. Our lives need to be focused on Jesus above all else. We can't try and fit Jesus into our political viewpoints. It's our faith that shapes our politics and not the other way around. The yeast, that, that thing that you allow to influence you, it will shape your life. And it may seem small, but it's one of the biggest factors in determining who you become. At the heart of this series, we're exploring what it means to live by kingdom values kingdom values in a political world. Because in John chapter 18, Jesus said these words. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Amen. He says, my kingdom, it's not of this world. Now, Jesus isn't denying, he's not denying the importance of, of government or law, but what he's doing is he's reminding us that his kingdom operates differently. His kingdom doesn't operate like the world's kingdom. Kingdom values, they challenge every political ideology. Where the world seeks power and control, Jesus calls us to serve, Amen. to humble ourselves. Where politics thrive on division, Jesus calls us to unity, to be united where political leaders promise salvation through policies, 
Jesus promises salvation through sacrifice. Through the work that Jesus did on the cross. That's where we find salvation. Church, I want you to hear me loud and clear. I'm not telling you that politics are bad. That's not what I'm saying. But when we give politics more authority in our lives than Jesus intended, things are out of line. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to challenge some political perspectives a little bit. We're going to learn what it means to follow Jesus in a politically charged, politically crazed world because let's be real. When we chase after the wrong things, it only leaves us wanting more. When you chase the wrong things in life, when you chase finances, when you chase politics, when you chase success, it only leaves you wanting more. But here's the thing. Only Jesus will truly satisfy. Only Jesus will truly satisfy. John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Church, the, the things that we chase, the bread that we chase, whether it's political power, whether it's success, whether it's something else, the things that we chase, the bread that we chase, it determines who we become. There's only one bread that leads to eternal life, and that's Jesus. That's Jesus. So let me wrap today with this question. What kind of yeast is influencing your life? What kind of yeast is influencing your life? Are you being shaped by kingdom values or political ones? And how you answer that question, it determines everything about how you engage with the political world and what you become. How you answer this question of what kind of yeast is influencing your life. We can change many different breads. And we can chase after them, going after all these different things. But in this life, there's only one bread that's worth pursuing. That's the bread of life. So over the next few weeks, let's commit to chasing the bread of life the only one who can truly satisfy. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that you are the bread of life. God, I ask for your forgiveness for those moments when we allow the wrong yeast to influence us, the wrong yeast to impact us. God, we ask for your forgiveness. God, we ask you to help us to carry your values. God, that we would carry your yeast found in, in kingdom values, found in pursuing you, found in a life with you. Jesus, we ask that you would help us to carry out kingdom values, that our faith would be what influences and shapes our politics and not the other way around. God, we thank you that you're the only bread worth chasing after, the only bread that truly satisfies as we keep praying this morning, maybe you came in today chasing something. You've been chasing after a void, a hole in your heart, a hole in your life. You've been trying to fill it. You're chasing after things, trying to fill this emptiness that you feel. You've tried drugs, you've tried alcohol, you've tried relationship, you've tried money. And all of those things have left you more empty than when you started chasing them. But today you walked in and you realized that what you've been chasing isn't working and you're ready. You've come to the end of your rope and you're ready to chase Jesus. To say yes to a relationship with Jesus. The only bread, the only thing that's going to fill that hole, that's going to fill that emptiness in your life. So if that's you this morning, with heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you to lift your hand on the count of three. And what we'll do is we'll repeat a prayer together, line by line. Everybody in the room, we don't want to single you out. We don't want to embarrass you. We want to lend strength to your voice. But if that's you today, ready to say yes 
to pursuing Jesus, to allowing him to fill the void in your life that you've been chasing. If that's you today, with heads bowed and with eyes closed, would you just lift your hand on the count of three? Ready? One, two, three. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow. Wow, God, you're moving this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Would you all pray this prayer with me? Say, dear Jesus, thank you for going to the cross so that I could have forgiveness. You paid my debt so I could live with you forever. Today, Jesus, I'm done chasing the world, the things that I think will fill me, and I'm chasing you. Jesus, I surrender to you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for new life. I receive your grace today. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we worship big and loud with the many that made a decision to say yes to Jesus today?